Since the early 90s, when the world began to recognise causes of climate change, such as fossil fuels and deforestation, scientists have been anticipating feedback loops as parts of the Earth begin to reveal the impact. So it, it descends the redox scale, it shows signs of iron reduction, but we don't see sulphate reduction. We don't see Based at 78 degrees on the remote islands of Svalbard and at the end of a three-year permafrost study, Professor Andy Hodson has assembled a crack team of Arctic scientists. Their job? To sense check evidence that permafrost feedbacks are having a bigger impact than previously thought. We invited some of the world's best permafrost scientists to Svalbard and we really wanted to get from them their view on the current state of the science and to, if you like, check that we're doing meaningful new research that can contribute to the bigger picture. Temperatures here in the summer hover around zero. It's a brief window of time to glimpse under the frozen landscape. Walking involves negotiating long, deep cracks in the ground, created by ice wedges during seasonal cycles of freeze and thaw. Viewed from the sky, these random cracks are actually a beautiful tapestry of strange polygons covering millions of square miles. We're dealing with a really complicated mosaic of landforms. One polygon can be completely different to the one next door. So this is one polygon over there, this is the second one here. These ice wedge polygons are the face of a system that's emitting huge amounts of greenhouse gases. But the impact it has on climate change is still not yet fully understood by scientists. And the more they learn about these mysterious shapes, the more challenges they encounter. So imagine we're measuring permafrost carbon emissions from the active layer and we find a nice relationship between soil temperature and annual methane release to the atmosphere. We could put a nice curve through that, what we call an empirical model. But as soon as we apply that to the polygon next door, then we find that things are slightly different and we don't have the understanding of why soil temperature doesn't produce the same accurate prediction of methane emission that we might have got from next door. The answers to this mystery won't be found in neat statistical curves. This is going to need a forensic approach to grasp what's actually going on deep beneath the permafrost. My work often involves measuring phenomena, but I understand that I can't measure everything that's happening in the system. I'd really like to know how to get those events into models. So I develop a relationship with a modeler who will look to see how he can constrain what I'm doing into a mathematical tool or model. There's a huge amount of field data to process, and it can take many patient years for a modeler to wrangle it and to tease out the underlying processes of such a complex system. So the main challenge, as I see it, is the process understanding. Uh, are we able to describe the main governing processes sufficiently accurately and disregard the unnecessary processes? Is this locally flat for you? Some of the most important problems with Arctic permafrost change can't all be measured. We can't be everywhere at once. So a model represents what's going on in reality and allows us to explore other parts of the Arctic and also to explore what's going to happen in the future and what's happened in the past. And that's one goal or objective as a modeler yeah. to be able to condense local site observations combined with the process understanding. And if we can do that, then we can make predictions at a larger scale. By crunching the data to unravel the secrets of the underlying physical system, the team are building up a genuine understanding of the mechanisms at play and not just relying on statistical data. Then you have a transportable mechanism for taking what you've learnt at one polygon and then predicting at the next, and then perhaps for scaling up to the, the myriad of polygons that exist in wetlands and permafrost lowlands across the Arctic. Scaling up the results from Svalbard to the rest of the Arctic is going to be a tough scientific challenge. 
It also means holding things lightly and embracing uncertainty. The more we understand a process, the more uncertainty exists because we're building in feedbacks that were known unknowns in the past and now we're starting to build them into our understanding of what might happen in future. So we really have to just buy uncertainty and uh, help science evolve to understand all these, this myriad of feedbacks that are complicating the overall picture. Communicating this message that uncertainty is a part of the normal world can be one of the greatest challenges these scientists face. So you'll often see a prediction that will say Earth's temperature will rise by one and a half degrees plus or minus up to you know four degrees perhaps. And often the plus or minus variability looks far too large compared to the projected warming itself. It basically means that we have a very variable system and so when we predict something we are building in a measure of how variable this natural process is. Even denitrification is hard to find evidence for. But as soon as you put the plant carbon in the system, you start to see the low redox things happening. It's been a successful week in this remote corner of the world. Bringing together some of our greatest thinkers like this has given them a rare opportunity to stop, sense check and share. We uh, need to put our sometimes esoteric work in a context and we need to simplify it and to describe the uncertainties in a way that is understandable. Today we quite simply know the uncertainty better than we did um, 40 years ago. It's really good when we, we come together in workshops the egos are left outside and we all start talking about our own work in a proper enthusiast's way. So we can all bring something different to the table. And unless we question each other, we will become lazy. We need to question each other to remain sharp all around.